Hello and welcome to Crime Watch Daily Updates. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. This case involves a teenage couple who was killed and tossed down an abandoned mine shaft in December of 2017. Breezy Otteson and Riley Powell died after meeting up with their friend Morgan Lewis at her home in Eureka, a former silver mining town. While they were there, Morgan's boyfriend returned home and he grew angry because he had forbidden her from having male friends over. Morgan Lewis later told police that her boyfriend tied up Breezy and Riley, duct taped their mouths and drove them to an abandoned mine outside of town. He then beat and stabbed Riley and slit Breezy's throat before tossing them both in the mine. After months of searching turned up nothing, the couple's family and friends got a break when Morgan was pulled over during an unrelated traffic stop in March of 2018. She eventually agreed to cooperate with police. In April of 2022, 45-year-old Gerald Baum was convicted of two counts each of aggravated murder, aggravated kidnapping, abuse of a human body, obstruction of justice, and possession of a dangerous weapon by a restricted person. Let's take a look back at the young couple who went missing before they could ring in the new year together. It's the night before New Year's Eve in Utah's West Desert town of Eureka. This is a very small, small town. It's classified as a ghost town used to be a mining town. You've got whole families who are living in this town who have known each other for, in some cases, generations. One of those residents is 17-year-old Braylon Otteson, known as simply Breezy. But according to her family, she had lived a life that was anything but. She's grown up a very difficult life. She lost her mother about six years ago. She just wanted to be loved. And she seemed to have found that love with her boyfriend, 18-year-old Riley Powell. Did you feel like this may have been just a teenage fling or was this something serious? No, I felt like it was serious. This was a meaningful relationship. Mm -hmm. She felt safe with him. And Riley felt safe with her after enduring a childhood plague with instability. As a young child, he was taken away from his biological mother, Misty Carlson, and adopted by his grandmother, Linda, and her husband at the time, Bill Powell. And you're Riley's father, correct? Right, I adopted him. You and Linda split up, but you had primary custody of Riley? Well, we both had joint custody of all the kids, but, but I pretty much had him then and she had the two girls. Was Riley happy? Seemed to be. And excited to ring in the new year together, now just a day away. But first, they had to make one more stop in Tooele to celebrate the holidays with Breezy's family before making the hour drive back to Eureka. And somewhere on their drive back from Tooele to Eureka, the teens appear to have vanished. When Riley and Breezy go missing, communication drops, you say, December 30th, right? Yes. Nobody hears from them? No social media activity? No social media activity, no debit card activity, no one has seen their vehicle, nobody knows where they are. No one can get a hold of the teens. Then, finally, after 72 hours of no contact, Breezy's family files a missing persons report with the Juab County Sheriff's Department. And with it being early January, with the average temps in the low 20s, this time of year, the authorities know time is of the essence to find the young couple. We received a report uh, through the Sheriff's Office on January 2nd um, of them reported missing. They'd been missing uh, estimated you know, two or three days. Authorities do uncover Facebook messages between Riley and this woman, Morgan Henderson. The messages are from the night the teens went missing. Investigators interview Henderson. She tells them she saw the couple that night, claiming they stopped by her place in Mammoth on their way back to Eureka, but that they left after about 40 minutes, and she never heard from them again. In fact, cops say that's the last known contact Breezy and Riley had with anyone. What was your initial impression of the case? Did you think it was a standard missing persons investigation or did you suspect foul play was involved? Well, on the onset, we didn't suspect foul play, but there's always that possibility. We were treating it like a search and rescue operation. Law enforcement agencies from Jueb and Tuella counties joined forces to search the massive 10,000 square mile area. Friends and family of the victims join in on the search with one noticeable exception. In the beginning, I had reached out to Misty, Riley's biological mother. She didn't respond back to me. The first initial search on January 5th, we would have thought that 
she would have been there, but she had messaged me the night before and said, thanks, wish I could do more, whatever that I mean, means. But there's a lot you could do, right? Exactly, exactly. Those were big red flags. On the other hand, Riley's adoptive father doesn't miss one search. Bill, the first seven days from when the kids went missing, he took his day from sunup to sundown, he was searching for those kids. But after days of searching and no sign of the teens, their families offer up a $2,000 reward for any information leading to Riley's missing Jeep. We were looking for a Jeep, not kids at that point, thinking the Jeep was our key to finding them. Then on January 11th, nine days after the teens were reported missing, a civil air patrol working with members of the Jewett County Search and Rescue makes a discovery. Located the Jeep. It's found parked near the Cherry Creek Reservoir, 14 miles from Riley's hometown of Eureka. So then once we found the Jeep, then as we started to, you know, investigate the Jeep further, then it started to lean towards foul play. Hidden in the bushes, there's windows rolled down, two of the tires have been slashed, they've been cut from the sides, not necessarily from running over something. Their clothing or their items are inside, but there is nothing else that's just they are gone from the vehicle and it's just sitting there as if it was abandoned or staged according to the sheriff where that jeep was located um, both the tires were deflated in place you know evidence there at the scene suggested that that jeep was driven into to that park location and then the tires were deflated subsequent to that but where are the passengers riley and breezy Sadly, there is no evidence found inside the car pointing to the location of the missing teenagers. Here you think there is a key piece to the puzzle of their disappearance, and, and not only does it fail to answer questions, but you say it raises even more questions. Correct. The Jeep was our key, and it failed, and we just continue with nothing. Well, not exactly. While processing the Jeep, investigators do make one interesting find. There's a toe strap uh, on, the on the back portion of the Jeep. Investigative teams collect the toe strap and take note of its appearance, a camouflage colored strap. And now with the discovery of the Jeep, the sheriff no longer believes this is a simple missing persons case. It is foul play. I mean, I believe that, I strongly believe that. And the sheriff's suspicions seem to be confirmed when a witness comes forward claiming to have seen a truck towing Riley's Jeep on the same day the teens were reported missing. And who does this truck belong to? It was none other than the living boyfriend of Riley's biological mother, Misty Carlson, a man named Lee Shepard. That's huge. That's huge because, again, we don't know how the Jeep got out there but you have somebody who sees that pickup truck towing Riley's Jeep. Investigators immediately get in contact with the couple. According to Sheriff Anderson, Misty fully cooperates with detectives, but her boyfriend, Lee? He, he's refused to interview with our detectives, you're, you're correct. It, it, that sounds like a major red flag. It, it is, it's a red flag. You know, it's something that, that heightens our suspicion. So much so that the very next day, the sheriff pulls a search warrant for Misty's home where she lives with her boyfriend, Lee. The property is near Loft Green in Tuella County. It must have been disconcerting though. It's not just any home. They're going into Misty's home. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are the last people you think would be involved. Right. Even more shocking, in the unsealed search warrants, investigators reveal they were looking for evidence of a homicide. The police are searching their house. The police are not only searching their house, they're looking for evidence that what is at Misty and Lee's house could have something to do with their disappearance and could have something to do with them being potentially murdered. It's stunning news for Breezy's aunt, Amanda. Do you think Breezy is still alive? I still have hope. From day one, from day one, it's always look at with Elizabeth Smart. It took nine months, but she was found alive. Not too far from here. Not too far, far from where we're at. And so there's hope. We're not giving up hope. According to the search warrants, inside the home, major crimes teams confiscate letters, receipts, drug paraphernalia, and something else that could blow this case wide open. Remember that camouflage toe strap found on Riley's Jeep? We found another another portion of that toe, or toe strap similar to that. In, in another truck, you know, from, from reports through our investigation that 
is close in, in, in appearance and, can, and uh, configuration to that tow strap we found on the Jeep. That was the one found on Lee Shepard's vehicle? It was, yes. Utah teenagers Riley Powell and Breezy Addison are missing and presumed dead after authorities discover the couple's Jeep abandoned under suspicious circumstances. The vehicle almost seems like it was just placed there. The sheriff's deputies get a tip from a witness who claims to have seen a man towing Riley's Jeep the same day the couple went missing. His name is Lee Shepard, and he also happens to be the boyfriend of Riley's biological mother, Misty. But when investigators attempt to question Lee... He refused to interview with our detectives. So I decide to see if I can get some answers and head over to Lee and Misty's home. All right, we're outside Misty's mobile home now. See if she's available to chat. Hi, Misty. Jason Matera with Crime Watch Daily. We're just doing a story on your son's disappearance. We're hoping you can assist. Come on, Crime Watch is here. Yeah, Crime Watch is here. We just have some questions. When was the last time that you saw Riley and Breezy? The 29th of December. I don't know, he just got excited and... Took off. Took off. He just, he just took off. Out the door. That was the last time I seen him. That's the last time you heard from him? Yeah. But I still had a few questions about the last time she saw her son, Riley. And that's when Misty appears to get emotional. We, Somebody out there knows what happened to my son, and it's not me. We, I we, don't... <laughs> I we, wouldn't hurt my son. Yeah, I gave him up for adoption. I. <laughs> and since Misty didn't raise Riley, some residents have attacked her character. Still, she does own up to her own shortcomings. I went through my lifestyle, yes, and my lifestyle... Uh, but you know what, I don't, I didn't do anything to my son. But that's what Misty had to say. I still wanted to talk to Lee, the man who was allegedly seen towing Riley's Jeep, and then refused to speak to investigators. Do you think Lee had any no, involvement? No, no, sir. No. No. And then Misty goes on to explain that she broke things off with her now ex-boyfriend, Lee Shepard, who we found living just down the road. Lee, hey, Jason Matera with... Crime Watch Daily, we're doing a story on Breezy and Riley's disappearance. We're hoping you can uh, assist us with the story. If I knew anything about them kids, everybody would have known as soon as I knew. The sheriff says you won't talk to him or his investigators. No, I talked to him. He says you're not cooperating. Not my words. Well, the first time they come out, I had cupboards out and painting, and my truck was broke down, and they want to go right then. I said, can I come in tomorrow? He's like, another day? I said, well, oh, yeah, you know. Lee explains that he was simply busy and not avoiding an interview with sheriff's deputies. And concerning that eyewitness who claims to have seen him towing Riley's Jeep? It never happened. Uh, it had to be somebody else. And then the question everyone wants answered. Lee, let me just ask you point blank. Did you have anything to do with Riley or Breezy's disappearance? No. Do you know what happened to them? No. And according to the sheriff, there isn't enough probable cause to arrest Lee, or anyone for that matter, especially without the missing teen's bodies. No, no suspects have been identified yet. Uh, there, there, there is circumstantial evidence. That evidence has to become physical evidence. We have to create the nexus to an individual before we can start identifying someone as suspects. But, he's, but it, I would say that they're strong investigative leads. But until any of those leads pan out, everyone is fair game. Have you cleared Lee Shepard as a person of interest? No one has been cleared. No one has been cleared until we, until we find out exactly what happened. Everybody that we've talked to uh, is connected to a lead that's been given to us that's taken us to that person. They're, they're still, they still remain to be a person of interest or an investigative lead. What about Riley's biological mom, uh, Misty? Is she considered a person of interest? She is. But a person of interest in what exactly? What even happened to Breezy and Riley? It's now been three long months since 18-year-old Riley Powell and his 17-year-old girlfriend, Breezy Otteson, went missing. Sheriff's deputies discover potential evidence pointing the finger at the missing boy's own family. But they admit there is not enough solid proof to name a suspect or make an arrest. I would say that they're strong investigative leads. The strongest lead being Riley's Jeep and the location of where it was discovered. It's a long shot, but our special correspondent, Elizabeth Smart, 
calls in a favor to an organization she has been working with to find missing persons. And Crime Watch Daily is there on the ground ready to meet up with these specialized searchers and join in the hunt for the missing teenagers. Paul, tell me about Scent Evidence. It's a company I started in 2012 after my time with the FBI to improve the processes and the methods for searching. Basically, the group pairs drones and dogs to search massive areas like Utah's West Desert, where Riley's Jeep was abandoned. The Juab Major Crimes Task Force and Scent Evidence K-9 map out the search area together. Commander, what's the game plan this morning? So we're going to go out west of Eureka, out to the Cherry Creek area, Cherry Creek Reservoir area, where the Riley's Jeep was located. Hopefully, maybe find Riley and Breezy today. For this particular search, the handlers and their three specialized canines made the 23-hour drive from Tallahassee, Florida to Eureka, Utah. We have a human remains canine, which Paul Martin, who's an expert in the field, an anthropologist, forensic anthropologist, will be working that dog. The command post is set up next to the Cherry Creek Reservoir where Riley's Jeep was found. The footage from the drones is transmitted back in real time so that if a discovery is made, law enforcement can move in quickly. Is it intimidating or overwhelming? You have so much land to cover. It can be intimidating, but I mean, you just have to take it a piece at a time and eliminate areas and move on to the next one. And hopefully that results in us finding the evidence we need for this case. The canines are assigned their scents, and the drones begin to follow the dogs as they track. I hear you. Well, let's go. At times, the dogs appear excited or headed in a specific direction. But sadly, after hours of searching through some of Utah's toughest terrain, the dogs can't pick up the scent of the missing teenagers. So far, she hasn't shown me any type of indication that she has found anything or detected anything. And if she did detect human remains, would she, what, sit at that location? She'd do it down and bark. The canine scent evidence search is called off. Then, 15 days later, the Juap County Sheriff's Department receives a tip. It was this morning that we got the call and it was drop everything and go. And the big break is the result of a routine traffic stop. A woman is picked up for speeding and put behind bars. That woman, Morgan Henderson, the same Morgan Henderson who exchanged Facebook messages with Breezy and Riley the night the teens went missing. Henderson originally told cops the couple came to her house, then left after about 40 minutes. Now she's telling detectives they're dead, and she knows where their bodies are buried. Details in the investigation led us to this location. The location is a piece of private property east of Eureka, an abandoned mine running 1,800 feet deep with an opening large enough to drive a semi through. 100 feet down on a ledge, investigators discover two bodies. Tragically, they are positively ID'd as 17-year-old Breezy Otteson and 18-year-old Riley Powell. We were ready for it. It's just, you know, still it's still not, you just don't know how you're gonna react when it comes. It's the closure we wanted, but it's, it's also obviously an emotional roller coaster. The teens' bodies were discovered in the Tintic Standard Mine in Eureka, just 22 miles away from the Cherry Creek Reservoir, where Riley's Jeep was abandoned. We've searched a lot of country, and then, I mean, to find them out that they're this close. Tragically, at a place they suspected from day one. It was actually on our list of ones to check. It was actually the first one we were going to check. But the mine shaft was on private property, which meant investigators needed a warrant in order to get permission to enter the mine. The detectives worked so hard. Um, it's, it's been tireless. Not only did Morgan Henderson lead investigators to the bodies, Henderson also pointed the finger at the man she told cops killed Breezy and Riley, her boyfriend. The reason we called for this press conference is to announce the charges against Jared Baum in relation to the kidnapping and the heinous and the depraved murders of Breezy Audison and Riley Powell. 
Henderson tells detectives that her boyfriend, 41-year-old Jared Baum, became enraged after discovering the teens hanging out with her without his permission. She claims in charging documents that Baum bound the victim's hands and feet, duct taped their mouths, and placed them in the back of Riley's Jeep. Then, according to Henderson, Baum drove the teens to the abandoned mine shaft, where she claims that Breezy was forced to kneel near the open mine pit and witness the beating of her boyfriend Riley Powell and his stabbing before she had her throat cut and was also thrown into the open mine. My brother didn't deserve this, and neither did she. We had a whole life, we had a whole life to live. She was only 17, he was 18. Baum, who was already behind bars in Joab County on unrelated parole violations, is booked into the Utah County Jail. Baum is facing eight felony counts, including two counts each of aggravated murder, aggravated kidnapping, and desecration of a human body, among other charges, and could face the death penalty. Mr. Baum could die for what he allegedly did. As for Jared's girlfriend, who claims she witnessed the gruesome slayings, Morgan Henderson is charged with obstruction of justice. We obviously wish she would have come forward earlier. That would have saved additional grief for the family. Um, but that's in consideration of these obstructing justice charges. Then it's time for Gerard Baum to face his victim's families during his first court appearance. He doesn't speak, but courtroom observers say Baum looked directly at Riley and Breezy's family members. Riley's father was in the courtroom front and center, staring right back at the man who allegedly took his son's life. Breezy and Riley won't, won't be having a nice life. They, have, they won't have one. You want justice? Oh, I definitely want justice. According to police documents, Henderson told investigators she was the one who moved Riley's Jeep to the location where it was found, but only because Baum threatened to take her life. She also says Baum told her, quote, it was too bad because he has never killed an innocent before, and that he felt bad about killing Breezy, so he made her death, quote, quick and painless. 